hello and welcome and good evening. I am Sam and you are listening to To Literacy, where tonight, when we get there, there will be some more three men in a boat. Which has a, uh, an unpleasant thing that I'll bring up a bit closer to the time, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, first of all, before we bring the boat down with that a little bit, it is good to see everybody here. Um, Stephen, lovely to see you. Um, obviously we've been chatting in chat beforehand, but yes, good to see you. I hope, you know, hope that you're having a good day. Uh, and Lady Mephistopheles and Majestic Salad as well. Also good to see you both, and I hope that you are both well. Um, actually, while I think of it, another thing that I need to do, because, you know, I went to a lot of effort to set up this, and I'm, hang on, I need to actually type a message in chat. There we go. Um... You know, when you go to a lot of effort to make the overlay flash like that, um, it looks really simple. If I describe it, it is actually very silly. But hey, um, you know, there we go. Thank you, me, for the 22 months in a row sub. Um, Salad, you hope I'm I'm well. I'm I'm doing okay. Yeah, I I mentioned the other day. Um, on in fact, yeah, it's on Wednesday stream. I mentioned that I was particularly anxious because I was having to take Joey to the vet on Thursday. Uh, good news, it's good news. Um, just get that out of the way quickly, which has been, frankly, beforehand, a tremendous point of stress. Um, flash warning might be good though. Some people might not react. That is a very good point. I had never considered that. Thank you. Um, huh. I wonder how best we can implement that. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I will have a think. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, because they kind of sub, no, sub alerts just sort of happen. Um, so I'm not sure how best to like warn, warn people with photosensitivity. Um, but yeah, we'll, I'll try and have a think about that. Um, but yes, as I was saying, I, I and, and Lucy, frankly, because she knows Joey very well. Um, a text layer to the overlay. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to think, because... I don't know, but I, I'm trying to think whether, there could, whether I could implement some kind of visual cue that... Yeah, I might be able to add something to it to be like a visual cue that sort of fits in with the rest of the overlay, perhaps? I don't know. Um, what I'm trying not to do right, right at this moment is, like, get pulled over into that, because then I will probably just never start the stream. Um, yeah, I, I will try and have a think and see what's feasible for me to actually add to the add to the overlay. Um, yeah, I might be able to do something. I don't know. Um, but yes, anyway, as I was saying, I... Yeah, Joey's been sort of a bit a bit unwell a bit poorly um wow saying a bit poorly makes you sound like a like a preschool teacher talking to a, a yeah to a preschool frankly that's what they do um he's he's just been unwell uh in various kinds of ailments and miseries for for a cat who is frankly as old as he is and doing as well as he is um and yeah i was i was very worried about that um as you would be and eventually took him to the vet on Thursday, fearing the worst. Um, the vet... I won't go into, like, all the details of, of like, the entire appointment, because, frankly, it's a very long story. The vet, firstly, was the loveliest person in the world. It was probably very obvious that I was quite stressed, but she was just the the best. Um, really, really good with, with Joey, who himself, for a cat who... He is the loveliest, softest, sweetest, gentlest cat, but he will assert his boundaries. If you if you cross the line, he will let you know with with the, the methods that he has learned. Uh, claws and teeth. And I always worry about that when taking him to the vet, and he was good as gold. He was just the, yeah, the, the loveliest, best cat. And it turns out the, the, the diagnosis was extremely mild. Um just mainly fleas a bad case of fleas which the stuff we've been using to treat had been doing nothing for um and sort of as a side effect of that he you know he was having some really bad skin complaints it was making him itch and just really bad constant 
incessant chronic itching and like skin issues and stuff and he knew he was there to get help you know it seems like it yeah he he just yeah i mean he might have just been dazed by the whole process of actually being outside the house and elsewhere and just like i don't really know what's going on but if i just play my card straight i might be able to get out of that door um but yeah they they gave him some treatments for it and they seem to be taking we've got more stuff to keep on going um but literally within a few hours of getting back his his entire demeanor had been changed um the 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 flea stuff was working wonders and gave him gave him flea tablets um which had been working wonders and the fleas have been leaving and so we need to start like treating for that and yeah just literally by by that night it was like having my old cat back again he just seemed so much happier more settled he's sleeping through the night without being agitated i am in short tremendously relieved um by this and so yeah that's that has made quite a big difference um and it's nice to be able to share the good news you know the, n the number of times someone will be like oh hey i had some really bad news about my pet and it's like oh no that sucks i know where this is going and so just to actually be able to instead share the good news because i know that frankly sure joe is my cat but he's our cat like he he <laughs> inserts and hurt, uh, inserts himself into the stream regularly um and you all know who he is you all know what he's like and so yeah that's you know it, it sucks to worry about having to break bad news so it's it's really nice to be able to share the good stuff side note hug your pets let them know they're loved you just should do that um usually a message shared when someone's grieving and there's bad news but you know hey always a good time um hug other people's pets too if they let you with permission of course but you know if, if don't don't adopt someone else's cat that's bad but if you're around someone's cat someone's someone's house no if you're around someone's cat and they've got a house um hug that cat <laughs> your parasocial relationship with internet pets is very real yes i mean that's that's a big part of the appeal of the internet you, you get to see other people's pets um boating time you should hug to the bathroom before this matters yeah indeed um yeah i'll, I'll be starting things in a few minutes um but i'm trying to think what what other stuff that's i mean that's kind of occupied my entire week so in terms of what i've been up to this week it's been that if you're on someone's cat and they have a house oh, they've got on the property ladder yeah true <laughs> i i i really want a yes and that but you know what it's too hot for me to think um yeah nice um, right, so, yeah, I I can't think of anything else aside to talk about, right off the top of my head, um, other than, I mean, on, on the subject of cats, I, I will probably at some point have to interrupt and distract myself because I have the windows ever so slightly open. I do not wish for the gremlin to escape, so, yeah, if he, if he comes through and notices that the windows are open, I will have to react sharply, but... You know, he's been pretty docile for now. But yes, Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. We continue from Chapter 6, and firstly, a uh, minor thing which I bring up even though... Well, because... Okay, so Lucy's not here this evening. She is busy. She's out at a, a concert singing. Um, but there is, in this, mention of something I know is at least one of her phobias, which is teeth. Um, so I just thought it's only polite to issue a content warning for that. If you are a little bit squeamish about teeth-related things, there is a, a very short remark. I don't really know how else to, like, highlight that before it comes up. Um, it's, uh, it's in, like, uh, what's it, four pages, if you should happen to be reading along. You can I don't know if the, the link at the top gives you an easy estimate of four pages. Um... No, it doesn't. It just has the text. Cool. Uh, well, if you can estimate about four pages worth. Um, be, be advised, there, there's a bit of a bit of teeth stuff coming up. Um, and secondly, as I alluded to at the start, on a far more unpleasant note, um, I've made... Because, you know, when 
when unpleasant language comes up, um, by which I mean, in this case, a deeply unpleasant racial slur, um, I, you know, I, I will tend to try to change it if I can sort of keep the flow of the text, or if it's if it's bad enough or ingrained enough, I will just try to edit that part out. Obviously, if it, if it's like if we're just reading like a racist tract, I'm not going to do that, which is why you don't hear Lovecraft on here. But yeah, this is just a warning, really, to anyone who is who is reading along with the text um, in chapter seven. So not not the chapter we're starting on, but the second chapter that I'll be reading in this first half of the stream. There is a term which, yeah, I don't want to like talk around it or dance around it and stuff like that. Um, it's explained in the back of the book what the exact reference being made means, um, but I just don't want to even go near it or swap, again, the deeply unpleasant racial slur out for something else. So I've just, like, omitted that whole bit um, and say I'm just kind of putting this warning out there so that if you are reading along um, when we get to chapter 7, yeah, there there is frankly a pretty repellent word that you will come across which is a shame um yeah i don't really know how much time and energy to give it here other than to say you know it's disappointing i'm sorry um yeah and again always always happy to take feedback on if there's better ways that we can handle it um my my own approach is this where i will read through i can't can't commit to reading an entire book before we stream it um that's that's just far too much time and work um for for me to put in on something um so ten, what i tend to do is read read sort of two hours ahead read you know the read ahead for what i'm going to be um reading on the stream and while i'm doing that do like a content check and just check for yeah frankly slurs other kinds of offensive material and stuff and make a decision on how best to to go around it and frankly not read offensive stuff on stream um so yeah as i say always always happy for suggestions and feedback on if if this is enough if we're not doing enough um and and what what people feel about that but yeah just just wanted to i don't know put that warning out there before we start um but with that said, I I guess I I shall carry on. Um, can't catch everything. It's always lovely to hear we look, hear that we're looking out for stuff. And yeah, that's I'm I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah, as I say, I just yeah I I know we we both want to be, want to be doing the the best um, best that we can for this for this audience. Um, so we're not we. <sighs> like there yeah there, there is a there is a time and a place for the texts to be like for the text to be explored unedited i would say that is for you know for, for much more of a like a literary discussion for for essentially i would try to think of it as like it's toxic material it is it is like it's like radioactive material and you need to be handling it with due caution and respect and if you are working in an environment where you can give it that that relevance like respect and distance and you know to, to keep yourself and in this case your audience from being contaminated by it um then you know that's that's the correct environment for that this isn't that this is just reading it for entertainment and frankly we we don't want to put that stuff out there so yeah um but anyway, I guess what I should probably do um, is carry on with the book. And I'm thinking, do I give myself a marker now? But no, I will include everything that's been said before this in the VOD that goes up onto YouTube. So if you come to the YouTube VOD expecting it to start from the start, hello, we're here now. Let's read a book. As we continue, With Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. Chapter 6 Kingston Instructive remarks on early English history Instructive observations on carved oak and life in general Sad case of Stivings, Jr. 
Musings on antiquity. I forget that I am steering. Interesting result. Hampton Court Maze. Harris as a guide. It was a glorious morning, late spring or early summer as you care to take it, when the dainty sheen of grass and leaf is blushing to a deeper green, and the year seems like a fair young maid trembling with strange wakening pulses on the brink of womanhood. The quaint back streets of Kingston, where they came down to the water's edge, looked quite picturesque in the flashing sunlight. The glinting river with its drifting barges, the wooden sorry, the wooded towpath, the trim kept villas on the other side, Harris in a red and orange blazer grunting away at the skulls, the distant glimpses of the grey old palace of the Tudors, all made a sunny picture, so bright but calm, so full of life and yet so peaceful that, early in the day though it was, I felt myself being dreamily lulled off into a musing fit. I mused on Kingston, or Kinningiston, as it was once called in the days when Saxon kings were crowned there. Great Caesar crossed the river there, and the Roman legions camped upon its sloping uplands. Caesar, like in later years Elizabeth, seems to have stopped everywhere, only he was more respectable than good Queen Bess. He didn't put up at the public houses. She was nuts on public houses, was England's virgin queen. There's scarcely a pub of any attractions within ten miles of London that she does not seem to have looked in at, or stopped at, or slept at, some time or other. I wonder now, supposing Harris, say, turned over a new leaf, and became a great and good man, and got to be Prime Minister, and died, if they would put up signs over the public houses that he had patronised. Harris had a glass of bitter in this house. Harris had two of scotch cold here in the summer of 88. Harris was chucked from here in December 1886. No, there would be too many of them. It would be the houses that he had never entered that would become famous. Only house in London that Harris never had a drink in. The people would flock to it to see what could have been the matter with it. How poor, weak-minded King Edwin must have hated Kinningiston. The coronation feast had been too much for him. Maybe Boar's head stuffed with sugar plums did not agree with him. It wouldn't with me, I know. And he had had enough of sack and mead, so he slipped from the noisy revel to steal a quiet moonlight hour with his beloved Elgiva. Excuse the loud traffic. Perhaps from the casement, standing hand in hand. It is a twenty mile an hour zone, folks. Perhaps from the casement, standing hand in hand, they were watching the calm moonlight on the river, while from the distant halls the boisterous revelry floated in broken bursts of faint heard din and tumult. Then brutal Odo and St Dunstan force their rude way into the quiet room and hurl coarse insults at the sweet-faced queen and drag poor Edwy back to the loud clamour of the drunken brawl. Years later, to the crash of battle music, Saxon kings and Saxon revelry were buried side by side, and Kingston's greatness passed away for a time, to rise once more when Hampton Court became the palace of the Tudors and the Stuarts and the royal barges strained at their moorings on the river's bank and bright-cloaked gallants swaggered down the water steps to cry, What ferry, ho! Gadzooks! Gramercy! Many of the old houses round about speak very plainly of those days when Kingston was a royal borough, and nobles and courtiers lived there near the king, and the long road to the palace gates was gay all day with clanking steel and prancing palfreys and rustling silks and velvets and fair faces, the large and spacious houses with the oriel latticed windows, their huge fireplaces and their gabled roofs, breathe of the days of hose and doublet, of pearl embroidered stomachers and complicated oaths. They were upraised in the days when men knew how to build. The red, so the hard red bricks have only grown more firmly set with time, and their oak stairs do not creak and grunt when you try to go down them quietly. Speaking of oak staircases, it reminds me that there is a magnificent carved oak staircase in one of the houses in Kingston. It is a shop now, in the marketplace, but it was evidently one once the mansion of some great personage. A friend of mine, who lives at Kingston, went in there to buy a hat one day, and, in a thoughtless moment, put his hand in his pocket and paid for it then and there. The shopman, he knows my friend, was naturally a little staggered at first, but quickly recovering himself and feeling that something ought to be done to encourage this sort of thing, asked our hero if he would like to see some fine old carved oak. 
My friend said he would, and the shopman thereupon took him through the shop and up the staircase of the house. The balusters were of a superb piece of workmanship, and the wall all the way up was oak panelled, with carving that would have done credit to a palace. From the stairs they went to the drawing room, which was a large, bright room decorated with a somewhat startling, though cheerful, paper of a blue ground. There was nothing, however, remarkable about the apartment, and my friend wondered why he had been brought there. The proprietor went up to the paper and tapped it. It gave forth a wooden sound. Oak, he explained, all carved oak right up to the ceiling, just the same as you saw on the staircase. But, great Caesar man, expostulated my friend, you don't mean to say you have covered over the carved oak with blue wallpaper. Yes, was the reply. It was expensive work. Had to match board, so had to match board it all over first, of course. But the room looks cheerful now. It was awful gloomy before. I can't say I altogether blame the man, which is doubtless a great relief to his mind. From his point of view, which would be that of the average householder, desiring to take life as lightly as possible, and not that of the old curiosity shop maniac, there is reason on his side. Carved oak is very pleasant to look at, and to have a little of, but it is no doubt somewhat depressing to live in, for those whose fancy does not lie that way. It would be like living in a church. No, what was sad in his case was that he, who didn't care for carved oak, should have his drawing-room panelled with it, while people who do care for it have to pay enormous prices to get it. It seems to be the rule of this world. Each person has what he doesn't want, and other people have what he does want. Married men have wives and don't seem to want them, and young single fellows cry out that they can't get them. Poor people who can hardly keep themselves have eight hearty children, rich old couples with no one to leave their money to, die childless. Then there are girls with lovers. The girls that have lovers never want them. They say they would rather be without them, that they bother them, and why don't they go and make love to Miss Smith and Miss Brown who are plain and elderly and haven't got any lovers? They themselves don't want lovers. They never mean to marry. It does not do to dwell on these things. It makes one so sad. There was a boy at our school. We used to call him Sanford and Merton. His real name was Stivings. He was the most extraordinary lad I ever came across. I believe he really liked study. He used to get into awful rowels for sitting up in bed and reading Greek, and as for French irregular verbs, there was simply no keeping him away from them. He was full of weird and unnatural notions about being a credit to his parents and an honour to the school, and he yearned to win prizes and grow up to be a clever man and had all those sort of weak-minded ideas. I never knew such a strange creature, yet harmless, mind you, as the babe unborn. Well, that boy used to get ill about twice a week so that he couldn't go to school. There never was such a boy to get ill as that Sanford and Merton. If there was any known disease going within ten miles of him, he had it, and had it badly. He would take bronchitis in the dog days and have hay fever at Christmas. After a six weeks period of drought, he would be stricken down with rheumatic fever, and he would go out in the November fog and come home with sunstroke. They put him under laughing gas one year, poor lad, and drew all his teeth and gave him a false set because he suffered so terribly with toothache, and then it turned to neuralgia and earache. He was never without a cold, except once, during, once for nine weeks when he had scarlet fever, and he always had chilblains. During the great cholera scare of 1871, our neighbourhood was singularly free from it. There was only one reputed case in the whole parish. That case was young Stivings. He had to stop in bed when he was ill, and eat chicken and custards and hothouse grapes, and he would lie there and sob because they wouldn't let him do Latin exercises, and took his German grammar away from him. And we other boys, who would have sacrificed ten terms of our school life for the sake of being ill for a day, and had no desire what to whatsoever to give our parents any excuse for being stuck up about us, couldn't catch so much as a stiff neck. We fooled about in draughts, and it did us good, and freshened us up. And we took things to make us sick, and they made us fat, and gave us an appetite. Nothing we could think of seemed to make us ill until the holidays began. Then, on the breaking up day, we caught colds and whooping cough and all kinds of disorders which lasted till the term recommenced, when, in spite of everything we could manoeuvre to the contrary, we would get suddenly well again and be better than ever. Such is life, 
we are but as grass that is cut down and put into the oven and baked. To go back to the carved oak question, they must have had very fair notions of the artistic and the beautiful, our great-great-grandfathers. Why, all our art treasures of today are only the dug-up commonplaces of three or four hundred years ago. I wonder if there is any real intrinsic beauty in the old soup plates, beer mugs and candle snuffers that we prize so now, or if it is only the halo of age glowing around them that gives them their charms in our eyes. The old blue that we hang about our walls as ornaments were the common everyday household utensils of a few centuries ago, and the pink shepherds and the yellow shepherdesses that we hand round now for all our friends to gush over and pretend they understand were the unvalued mantle ornaments that the mother of the 18th century would have given to the baby to suck when he cried. Will it be the same in the future? Will the prized treasures of today always be the cheap trifles of the day before? Will rows of our willow pattern dinner plates be ranged above the chimney pieces of the great in the years 2000 and odd? Will the white cups with the gold rim and the beautiful flower, beautiful gold flower inside, species unknown, that our Sarah Janes now break in sheer light-heartedness of spirit, be carefully mended and stood upon a bracket and dusted only by the lady of the house? That china dog that ornaments the bedroom of my furnished lodgings. It is a white dog. Its eyes are blue. Its nose is a delicate red with black spots. Its head is painfully erect, and its expression is amiability carried to the verge of imbecility. I do not admire it myself. Considered as a work of art, I may say it irritates me. Thoughtless friends jeer at it, and even my landlady herself has no admiration for it, and excuses its presence by the circumstances that her aunt gave it to her. But in two hundred years' time, it is more than probable that the dog will be dug up from somewhere or other, minus its legs and with its tail broken, and will be sold for old china and put in a glass cabinet, and people will pass it round and admire it. They will be struck by the wonderful depth of the colour on the nose and speculate as to how beautiful the bit of the tail that is lost, no doubt, was. We, in this age, do not see the beauty of that dog. We are too familiar with it. It is like a sunset and the stars. We are not awed by their loveliness because they are common to our eyes. So it is with that china dog. In 2288, people will gush over it. The making of such dogs will have become a lost art. Our descendants will wonder how we did it and say how clever we were. We should be referred to lovingly as those grand old artists that flourished in the 19th century and produced those china dogs. The sampler that the eldest daughter did at school will be spoken of as tapestry of the Victorian era and be almost priceless. The blue and white mugs of the present day roadside inn will be hunted up and cracked and ch all cracked and chipped and sold for their weight in gold and rich people will use them for claret cups and travellers from Japan will buy up the presents from Ramsgate and souvenirs of Margate that may have escaped destruction and take them back to Jeddo as in ancient English curios. At this point, Harris threw away the skulls, got up and left his seat, and sat on his back and stuck his legs up in the air. Montmorency howled and turned a somersault, and the top hamper jumped up, and all the things came out. I was somewhat surprised, but I did not lose my temper. I said, pleasantly enough, Hello, what's that for? What's that for? Why? No on second thoughts, I will not repeat what Harris said. I may have been to blame, I admit it, but nothing excuses violence of language and coarseness of expression, especially in a man who has been carefully brought up, as I know Harris has been. I was thinking of other things, and forgot, as anyone might easily understand, that I was steering, and the consequence was that we had got mixed up a good deal with the towpath. It was difficult to say, for the moment, which was us and which was the Middlesex bank of the river, but we found out after a while and separated ourselves. Harris, however, said he had done enough for a bit and proposed that I should take a turn. So, as we were in, I got out and took the tow-line and ran the boat on past Hampton Court. What a dear old wall that is that runs along by the river there. I never pass it without feeling better for the sight of it. Such a mellow, bright, sweet old wall. What a charming picture it would make with the lichen creeping here and the moss growing there, a shy young vine peeping over the top at this spot to see what is going on upon the busy river, 
and the sober old ivy clustering a little farther down. There are fifty shades and tints and hues in every ten yards of that old wall. If I could only draw and knew how to paint, I could make such a lovely sketch of that old wall, I'm sure. I've often thought I should like to live at Hampton Court. It looks so peaceful and so quiet, and is so much a dear old place to ramble about in the early morning, before many people are about. But there, I don't suppose I should really care for it when it came to actual practice. It would be so ghastly dull and depressing in the evening when your lamp cast uncanny shadows on the panelled walls, and the echo of distant feet rang through the cold stone corridors, and now drew nearer and now died away, and all was death-like silence, save the beating of one's own heart. We are creatures of the sun, we men and women. We love light and life. That is why we crowd into the towns and cities, and the country grows more and more deserted every year. In the sunlight, in the daytime, when nature is alive and busy all around us, we like the open hillsides and the deep woods well enough. But in the night, when our mother earth has gone to sleep and left us waking, oh, the world seems so lonesome, and we get frightened like children in a silent house. Then we sit and sob and long for the gas-lit streets and the sound of human voices and the answering throb of human life. We feel so helpless and so little in the great stillness when the dark trees rustle in the night wind. There are so many ghosts about, and their silent sighs make us feel so sad. Let us gather together in the great cities, and light huge bonfires of a million gas jets, and shout and ring together and feel brave. Harris asked me if I'd ever been in the maze at Hampton Court. He said he went in once to show somebody else the way. He had studied it up in a map, and it was so simple that it seemed foolish, hardly worth the twopence charged for admission. Harris said he thought the map must have been got up as a practical joke, because it was a bit like the real thing and only misleading. So it wasn't a bit like the real thing and only misleading. It was a, it was a country cousin that Harris took in, he said. Sorry, that Harris took in. He said, we'll just go in here so that you can say you've been in. But it's very simple. It's absurd to call it a maze. You keep on taking the first turning to the right. We'll just walk round for ten minutes and then go and get some lunch. They met some people soon after they had got inside, who said they had been there for three quarters of an hour, and had had just about enough of it. Harris told them that they could follow him if they liked. He was just going in and then should turn round and come out again. They said it was very kind of him, and fell behind, and followed. They picked up various other people who wanted to get it over, as they went along, until they absorbed all the persons in the maze. People who had given up all hopes of ever getting either in or out, or of ever seeing their home and friends again, plucked up courage at the sight of Harris and his party, and joined the procession, blessing him. Harris said he should judge there must have been twenty people following him, all in all, and one woman with a baby who had been there all morning, insisting on taking his arm for fear of losing him. Harris kept on turning to the right, but it seemed a long way, and his cousin said he supposed it was a very big maze. "'Oh, one of the largest in Europe,' said Harris. "'Yes, it must be,' replied the cousin, "'because we've walked a good two miles already.' Harris began to think it rather strange himself, but he held on until, at last, they passed the half-a-penny bun on the ground that Harris's cousin swore he had noticed there seven minutes ago. Harris said, "'Oh, impossible!' But the woman with the baby said, "'Not at all,' as she herself had taken it from the child and thrown it down there just before she met Harris. She also added that she wished she never had met Harris, and expressed an opinion that he was an impostor. That made Harris mad, and he produced his map and explained his theory. "'That map may be all right enough,' said one of the party, "'if you know whereabouts in it we are now.' Harris didn't know and suggested that the best thing to do would be to go back to the entrance and begin again. For the beginning again part of it there was not much enthusiasm, but with regard to the advisability of going back to the entrance there was complete unanimity, and so they turned and trailed after Harris again in the opposite direction. About ten more passed, so about ten minutes more passed, and then they found themselves in the centre. 
Harris thought at first of pretending that that was what he had been aiming at, but the crowd looked dangerous and he decided to treat it as an accident. Anyhow, they had got something to start from then. They did know where they were, and the map was once more consulted and the thing seemed simpler than ever, and off they started for the third time. And three minutes later they were back in the centre again. After that, they simply couldn't get anywhere else. Whatever way they turned brought them back to the middle. It became so regular at length that some of the people stopped there and waited for the others to take a walk round and come back to them. Harris drew out his map again after a while, but the sight of it only infuriated the mob, and they told him to go and curl his hair with it. Harris said that he couldn't help feeling that, to a certain extent, he had become unpopular. They all got crazy at last and sang out for the keeper, and the man came and climbed up the ladder outside and shouted out directions to them. But all their heads were, by this time, in such a confused whirl that they were incapable of grasping anything, and so the man told them to stop where they were and he would come to them. They huddled together and waited, and he climbed down and came in. He was a young keeper, as luck would have it, and new to the business, and when he got in he couldn't get to them, and then he got lost. They caught sight of him every now and then, rushing about to the other side of the hedge, and he would see them and rush to get them, get to them, and they would wait there for about five minutes, and then he would reappear again in exactly the same spot and ask them where they had been. They had to wait until one of the old keepers came back from his dinner before they got out. Harris said he thought it was a very fine maze, so far as he was a judge, and we agreed that we would try to get George to go into it on our way back. Chapter 7 The river in its Sunday garb Dress on the river A chance for the men Absence of taste in Harris George's blazer A day with the fashion plate young lady Mrs Thomas's tomb The man who loves not graves and coffins and skulls Harris mad His views on George and Banks and lemonade He performs tricks it was while passing through Mount Molsey Lock that Harris told me about his maze experience. It took us some time to pass through, as we were the only boat, and it is a big lock. I don't think I ever remember to have seen Molsey Lock before, with only one boat in it. It is, I suppose, bolters not even accepted, the busiest lock on the river. I have stood and watched it sometimes, when you could not see any water at all, but only a brilliant tangle of bright blazers and gay caps and saucy hats and many-coloured parasols and silken rugs and cloaks and streaming ribbons and dainty whites. And when looking down into the lock from the quay, you might fancy it was a huge box into which flowers of every hue and shade had been thrown pell-mell and lay piled up in a rainbow heap that covered every corner. On a fine Sunday it presents this appearance nearly all day long, while up the stream and down the stream lie, waiting in their turn outside the gates, long lines of still more boats, and boats are drawing near and passing away, so that the sunny river, from the palace up to Hampton Church, is dotted and decked with yellow and blue and orange and white and red and pink. All the inhabitants of Hampton and Molsey dress themselves up in boating costume, and come and mooch round the lock with their dogs, and flirt and smoke and watch the boats, and all together, what with the caps and jackets of the men, the pretty coloured dresses of the women, the excited dogs, the moving boats, the white sails, the pleasant landscape and the sparkling water, it is one of the gayest sights I know of near this dull old London town. The river affords a good opportunity for dress. For once in a way we, are, we men are able to show our taste in colours, and I think we come out very natty, if you ask me. I always like a little red in my things, red and black. You know my hair is a sort of golden brown, rather a pretty shade, I've been told, and a dark red matches it beautifully. And then I always think a light blue necktie goes so well with it, and a pair of those Russian leather shoes and a red silk handkerchief round the waist. A handkerchief looks so much better than a belt. Harris always keeps to shades or mixtures of orange or yellow, but I don't think he is at all wise in this. His complexion is too dark for yellows. Yellows don't suit him. There can be no question about it. I want him to take to blue as a background with white or cream for relief, but 
There, the less taste a person has in dress, the more obstinate he always seems to be. It is a great pity, because he will never be a success at it, a success as it is, while there are one or two colours in which he might not really look so bad, with his hat on. George has bought some new things for this trip, and I'm rather vexed about them. The blazer is loud. I should not like George to know that I thought so, but there really is no other word for it. He brought it home and showed it to us on Thursday evening. We asked him what colour he called it, and he said he didn't know. He didn't think there was a name for the colour. The man had told him it was an oriental design. George put it on and asked us what we thought of it. Harris said that, as an object to hang over a flower bed in early spring to frighten the birds away, he should respect it. But that, considered as an article of dress for a human being, it made him ill. George got quite huffy, but as Harris said, if he didn't want his opinion, why did he ask for it? What troubles Harris and myself with regard to it is that we are afraid it will attract attention to the boat. Girls also don't look half bad in a boat, if prettily dressed. Nothing is more fetching to my thinking than a tasteful boating costume. But a boating costume, it would be... But, but a boating costume, it would be as well, if all ladies would understand, ought to be a costume that can be worn in a boat and not merely under a glass case. It utterly spoils an excursion if you have folk in the boat who are thinking all the time a good deal more of their dress than of the trip. It was my misfortune once to go for a water picnic with two ladies of this kind. We did have a lively time. They were both beautifully got up all lace and silky stuff and flowers and ribbons and dainty shoes and light gloves but they were dressed for a photographic studio not for a river picnic they were the boating costumes of a french fashion plate it was ridiculous fooling about in them anywhere near real earth air and water the first thing was that they thought that the boat was not clean we dusted all the seats for them and, uh, and then assured them that it was but they didn't believe us one of them rubbed the cushion with the forefinger of her glove and showed the result to the other, and they both sighed and sat down with the air of early Christian martyrs trying to make themselves comfortable up against the stake. You are liable to occasionally splash a little while sculling, and it appeared that a drop of water ruined those costumes. The mark never came out, and a stain was left on the dress for ever. I was stroke. I did my best. I feathered some two feet high, and I paused at the end of each stroke to let the blades drip before returning them, and I picked out a smooth bit of water to drop them into again each time. Bow said after a while that he did not feel himself a sufficiently accomplished oarsman to pull with me, but that he would sit, sit still if I would allow him and study my stroke. He said it interested him. But notwithstanding all this, and try as I would, I could not help the occasional flicker of water from going over those dresses. The girls did not complain, but they huddled up close together, and set their lips firm, and every time a drop touched them they visibly shrank and shuddered. It was a noble sight to see them suffering thus in silence, but it unnerved me altogether. I am too sensitive. I got wild and fitful in my rowing, and splashed more and more the harder I tried not to. I gave it up at last. I said I'd row bow. Bow thought the arrangement would be better too, and we changed places. The ladies gave an involuntary sigh of relief when they saw me go, and quite brightened up for a moment. Poor girls! They had better have put up with me. Yeah, sorry. Um, poor girls! They had better have put up with me. The man they had got now was a jolly, light-hearted, thick-headed sort of chap with about as much sensitiveness in him as there might be in a Newfoundland puppy. You might look daggers at him for an hour, and he would not notice it, and it would not trouble him if he did. He set a good, rollicking, dashing stroke that sent the spray playing all over the boat like a fountain, and made the whole crowd sit up straight in no time. When he spread more than a pint of water over one of those dresses, he would give a pleasant little laugh and say, <laughs> I beg your pardon, I'm sure, and offer them his handkerchief to wipe it off with. Oh, it's of no consequence, the poor girls would murmur in reply, and covertly draw rugs and coats over themselves, and try and protect themselves with their lace parasols. At lunch they had a very bad time of it. People wanted them to sit on the grass, and the grass was dusty, and the tree trunks against which they were invited to lean did not appear to have been brushed for weeks, so they spread their handkerchiefs on the ground and sat on those bolt upright. Somebody, in walking about with a plate of beefsteak pie, tripped up over a root and sent the pie flying. 
None of it went over them, fortunately, but the accident suggested a fresh danger to them and agitated them. And whenever anybody moved about after that with anything in his hand that could fall and make a mess, they watched that person with growing anxiety until he sat down again. "'Now then, you girls,' said our friend, bow to them cheerily after it was all over. "'Come along, you've got to wash up.' They didn't understand him at first. When they grasped the idea, he said they feared they did not know how to wash up. "'Oh, I'll soon show you,' he cried. "'It's rare fun. You lie down on your... I mean you lean over the bank, you know, and slush the things about in the water.' The elder sister said that she was afraid they hadn't got on dresses suited to the work. "'Oh, they'll be all right,' he said light-heartedly. "'Tuck them up.' And he made them do it, too. He told them that sort of thing was half the fun of a picnic. They said it was very interesting. Now I come to think of it, was that young man as dense-headed as we thought? Or was he... No, impossible. There was such a simple, childlike expression about him. Harris wanted to get out at Hampton Church to go and see Mrs. Thomas's tomb. "'Who is Mrs. Thomas?' I asked. "'How should I know?' replied Harris. "'She's a lady that's got a funny tomb, and I want to see it.' "'I objected. "'I don't know whether it is that I am built wrong, "'but I never did seem to hanker after tombstones myself. "'I know that the proper thing to do when you get to a village or town "'is to rush off to the churchyard and enjoy the graves. "'But it is a recreation that I always deny myself.' I take no interest in creeping round dim and chilly churches behind wheezy old men and reading epitaphs. Not even the sight of a bit of cracked brass let into a stone affords me what I call real happiness. I shock respectable sextons by the imperturbability I am able to assume before exciting inscriptions, and by my lack of enthusiasm for the local family history, while my ill-concealed anxiety to get outside wounds their feelings. One golden morning of a sunny day I leant against the low stone wall that guarded Little Village Church, and I smoked and drank in deep, calm gladness so I smoked and drank in deep calm gladness from the sweet, restful scene, the grey old church with its clustering ivy and its quaint carved wooden porch, the white lane winding down the hill between tall rows of elms, the thatched roof cottages peeping above their trim kept hedges, the silver river on the hollow, the wooded hills beyond. It was a lovely landscape. It was idyllic, poetical, and it inspired me. I felt good and noble. I felt I didn't want to be sinful and wicked any more. I would come and live here and never do any more wrong and lead a blameless, beautiful life and have silver hair when I got old and all that sort of thing. In that moment I forgave all my friends and relations for their wickedness and cussedness, and I blessed them. They did not know that I blessed them. They went their abandoned way, all unconscious of what I, far away in that peaceful village, was doing for them. But I did it, and I wished that I could let them know that I had done it, because I wanted to make them happy. I was going on, thinking away all these grand tender thoughts when my reverie was broken in upon by a shrill piping voice crying out all right sir i'm a coming i'm a coming it's all right sir don't you be in a hurry i looked up and saw an old bald-headed man hobbling across the churchyard towards me carrying a bunch of keys in his hand that shook and jingled at every step i motioned him away with silent dignity but he still advanced screeching out the while i'm a coming sir i'm a coming i'm a little lame i ain't as spry as i used to be this way sir "'Go away, you miserable old man,' I said. "'I've come as soon as I could, sir,' he replied. "'My missus just see... Sorry, "'My missus never see you till just this minute. "'You follow me, sir.' "'Go away,' I repeated. "'Leave me before I get over the wall and slay you.' "'He seemed surprised. "'Don't you want to see the tombs?' he said. "'No,' I answered. "'I don't. "'I want to stop here, leaning up against this gritty old wall. "'Go away and don't disturb me. "'I am chock-full of beautiful and noble thoughts, and I, want to, "'and I want to stop like it, because it feels very nice and good. "'Don't you come fooling about, making me mad, "'chivying away all my better feelings "'with this silly tombstone nonsense of yours. "'Go away and get somebody to bury you cheap, "'and I'll pay half the expense.' "'He was bewildered for a moment. "'He rubbed his eyes and looked hard at me. "'I seemed human enough on the outside.' He couldn't make it out. He said, 
You's a stranger in these parts. You don't live here. No, I said. I don't. You wouldn't if I did. Well then, he said. You want to see the tombs, graves, folks been buried, you know, coffins. You are an untruther, I replied, getting roused. I do not want to see tombs. Not your tombs. Why should I? We have graves of our own. Our family has. Why, my Uncle Podger has a tomb in Kensal Green Cemetery. Cemetery. That is the pride of all the countryside, and my grandfather's vault at Bow is capable of accommodating eight visitors, while my great-aunt Susan has a brick grave in Finchley Churchyard, with a headstone with a coffee-pot sort of thing in bas-relief upon it, and a six-inch best white stone coping all the way round that cost pounds. When I want graves, it is to those places that I go and revel. I do not want other folks. When you yourself are buried, I will come and see yours. That is all I can do for you. He burst into tears. He said that one of the tombs had a bit of stone upon the top of it that had been said by some to be probably part of the remains of the figure of a man, and that another had some words carved upon it that nobody had ever been able to decipher. I still remained obdurate, and, in broken-hearted tones, he said, "'Well, won't you come and see the memorial window?' I would not even see that. So he fired his last shot. He drew near, and whispered hoarsely, "'We've got a couple of skulls down in the crypt,' he said. "'Come and see those. Oh, do come and see the skulls. You are a young man out for a holiday, and you want to enjoy yourself. Come and see the skulls.' Then I turned and fled, and as I spared, I heard him calling to me, Oh, come and see the skulls! Come back and see the skulls! Harris, however, revels in tombs and graves and epitaphs and monumental inscriptions, and the thought of not seeing Mrs. Thomas's grave made him crazy. He said he had looked forward to seeing Mrs. Thomas's grave from the first moment that the trip was proposed, said he wouldn't have joined if it hadn't been for the idea of seeing Mrs. Thomas's tomb. I reminded him of George and how we had to get the boat up to Shepperton by five o'clock to meet him, and then he went for George. Why was George to fool about all day and leave us to lug this lumbering old heavy, top-heavy barge up and down the river by ourselves to meet him? Why couldn't George come and do some work? Why couldn't we have got the day off and come down? Sorry, why couldn't he have got the day off and come down with us? Bank be blowed. What good was he at the bank? There's fireworks again. Okay, cool. I never see him doing any work there, continued Harris. Whenever I go in, he sits behind a bit of glass all day, trying to look as if he was doing something. What's the good of a man behind a bit of glass? I have to work for my living. Why can't he work? What use is he there? And what's the good of their banks? They take your money, and then when you draw a cheque, they send it back smeared all over with no effects, refer to drawer. What's the good of that? There's a, that's the sort of trick they served me twice last week. I'm not going to stand it much longer. I shall withdraw my account. If he was here, we could go and see that tomb. I don't believe he's at the bank at all. He's larking about somewhere. That's what he's doing, leaving us to do all the work. I'm going to get out and have a drink. I pointed out to him that we were miles away from a pub, and then he went on about the river, and what the good of the river, and everyone who came on the river to... Sorry. I'll start that bit again. I pointed out to him that we were miles away from a pub. And then he went on about the river, and what was the good of the river, and was everyone who came on the river to die of thirst? It is always best to let Harris have his head when he gets like this. Then he pumps himself out and is quiet afterwards. I reminded him that there was concentrated lemonade in the hamper, and a gallon jar of water in the nose of the boat, and that the two only wanted mixing to make a cool and refreshing beverage. Then he flew off about the lemonade, and such like Sunday school slops, as he termed them, ginger beer, raspberry syrup, etc., etc. He said they all produced dyspepsia, and ruined body and soul alike, and were the cause of half the crime in England. He said he must drink something, however, and climbed upon the seat, and leant over to get the bottle. It was right at the bottom of the hamper, and seemed difficult to find and he had to lean over farther and farther, and, in trying to steer at the same time from a topsy-turvy point of view, he pulled the wrong line, and sent the boat into the bank, and the shock upset him, and he dived down right into the hamper, and stood there on his head, holding on to the sides of the boat like grim death, his legs sticking up into the air. He dared not move for fear of going over, and had to stay there till I could get hold of his legs and haul him back, and that made him madder than ever. 
And that brings us to the end of the chapter and where I shall send you all off for a break and hopefully the fireworks will play out and stop distracting me quite as badly as they are. So, yes, I will go to a break. Get up, if you can, do the stretches if you need. Um, give remind, like, frankly, with this heat, hydration reminder, drink your fluids, cycle those fluids, do your stretches and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I'll see you back here in five minutes. Well, I guess we can have a bit of a discussion about the competency of these, of these fine protagonists before we carry on. But yeah, see you, see you back here in five minutes, friends.
are back. Hello. I I hope that everyone has had a successful and fulfilling break. Um, the fireworks currently have abated. Uh, so you say in the round bounce, it helps you don't think it's coming through for the stream. You didn't notice anything. Okay. Oh, probably you maybe heard a couple of faint pops. Yeah, it's it's I, I guess I mean it's distracting to me. Um, this is like th this is very much one that I sort of. I kind of I, I guess I can get into like a flow while reading. It feels like for me, and suddenly having to like having a whole bunch of extra noise going on in the background just sort of pulls my attention. Um, but yeah, we're back. Uh, I shall carry on in a sec. Um, I mean, I don't know. I I feel like what I not for discussion now because it would probably take up a large chunk of the rest of the stream. Um, but I want, what I want to talk about in the next, like, Chill It or a Tea um, podcast is kind of the unlikable protagonist, the fact that Jerome himself, like, I, I hope it comes across that in, in the text to, to you, the audience, that he is also an unlikable character. Like, he is, he is every much... The, the hypocrite, the hypochondriac, the like everything else that he dislikes in the people around him, he also he's massively projecting. He seems like a bit of a butt. Yeah, exactly. And like not not in a like truly deeply like offensive and upsetting kind of way, but just he's he's a colossal hypocrite. He's kinda sexist. Um he's yeah, in, in many different ways and directions just not a he's not someone he's supposed to like admire and look up to and go yes I would like to be like this man and kind of the almost I guess the the interesting framing to me of essentially it being an author self-insert that he has put himself in there for ridicule as well as much as anyone else one of those guys would be massively annoying IRL but to read about is hilarious yeah and like I said I, I hope that's coming across that because if, I feel like if this if this were earnest, if I felt that that the the author actually wanted me to like admire and respect this person, I would be put off this book in an instant. But because he's being held up as another figure of, of mockery, and essentially he's there for you to to laugh at as much as he's laughing at everyone else, I feel like it works, um, and it it makes it palatable. Um, you love unlikable protagonist, contradictory sentence, but you, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I just I I feel like it's it's always an interesting discussion in frankly any media when you're like when you're tethered to someone who you kind of don't like, but you have to make them kind of sympathetic enough. You love them calling out someone else who being a hypochondriac. Yeah, exactly. When he himself, yeah, and and frankly, like. There's, there's nothing wrong with thinking like again it's like we we hold hypochondria up as a bad thing when actually you know a lot of people think they will a lot of the time because they are um you shouldn't necessarily shame people for thinking they will that's a whole other discussion for another day um after his description of how he had almost sorry after his description of how he had almost the things in the book he found yeah oh yeah 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 right at the start I mean, it's like well i've read all these things and the only thing i didn't have was housemaid's knee it's yeah when people miss that the protagonist is supposed to be in the wrong that's when it gets bothersome yeah exactly that and that's that's where you get i mean my background is the likes of fight club um films and stuff like that where it's like oh this guy's so cool no no he's not you're supposed to hate him but oh oh well anyway i'm getting off onto a whole new topic and we should carry on with the book so let us carry on with chapter eight blackmailing the proper course to pursue selfish boorish boorishness of riverside landover notice boards unchristian like feelings of harris how Harris sings a comic song. A high-class party. Shameful conduct of two abandoned young men. Some useless information. George buys a banjo. We stopped under the willows by Kempton Park and lunched. It 
is a pretty little spot there, a pleasant grass plateau running along by the water's edge and overhung by willows. We had just commenced the third course, the bread and jam, when a gentleman in shirt sleeves and a short pipe came along and wanted to know if we knew that we were trespassing. We said we hadn't given the matter sufficient consideration as yet to enable us to arrive at a definite conclusion on that point, but that, if he assured us on his word as a gentleman that we were trespassing, we would, without further hesitation, believe it. He gave us the required assurance, and we thanked him, but he still hung about and seemed to be dissatisfied. So we asked him if there was anything further that we could do for him, and Harris, who is of a chummy disposition, offered him a bit of bread and jam. I fancy he must have belongs to some society sworn to abstain from bread and jam, for he declined it quite gruffly, as if he were vexed at being tempted with it, and he added that it was his duty to turn us off. Harris said that it was a duty to be sorry, Harris said that if it was a duty it ought to be done, and asked the man what his idea what was his idea with regard to the best means for accomplishing it. Harris is what you would call a well made man of about number one size, and looks hard and bony, and the man measured him up and down, and said he would go and consult his master, and then come back and chuck us both into the river. Of course, we never saw him any more, and of course, all he really wanted was a shilling. There are a number of sorry, there are a certain number of riverside roughs who make quite an income during the summer by slouching about the banks and blackmailing weak minded noodles in this way. They represent themselves as sent by the proprietor. The proper course to pursue is to offer your name and address and leave the owner, if he really has anything to do with the matter, to summon you and prove what damage you have done to his land by sitting down on a bit of it. But the majority of people are so intensely lazy and timid that they prefer to encourage the imposition by giving in to it rather than put an end to it by exertion of a little firmness. Where it is really the owners that are to, uh, sorry, where it is really the owners that are to blame, they ought to be shown up. The selfishness of the riparian proprietor grows with every year. If these men had their way, they would close the river Thames altogether. They actually do this along the minor tributary streams and in the backwaters. They drive posts into the bed of the stream and draw chains across from bank to bank and nail huge notice boards on every tree. The sight of those notice boards rouses every evil instinct in my nature. I feel I want to tear each one down and hammer it over the head of the man who put it up until I have killed him, and then I would bury him and put the board up over the grave as a tombstone. I mentioned those feelings of mine to Harris, and he said he had them worse than that. He said he not only felt he wanted to kill the man who caused the board to be put up, but that he should like to slaughter the whole of his family and all his friends and relations and then burn down his house. This seemed to me to be going too far, and I said so to Harris. But he answered, not a bit of it. Serve them all jolly well right, and I'd go and sing comic songs on the ruins. I was vexed to hear Harris go on in this bloodthirsty strain. We never ought to allow our instincts of justice to degenerate into mere vindictiveness. It was a long while before I could get Harris to take a more Christian view on the subject, but I succeeded at last, and he promised me that he would spare the friends and relations at all events, and would not sing comic songs on the ruins. You have never heard Harris sing a comic song, or you would understand the service I had rendered to mankind. It is one of Harris's fixed ideas that he can sing a comic song. The fixed idea, on the contrary, among those of Harris's friends who have heard him try is that he can't, and never will be able to, and that he ought not to be allowed to try. When Harris is at a party and is asked to sing, he replies, Well, I can only sing a comic song, you know. And he says it in a tone that implies that his singing of that, however, is a thing that you ought to hear once and then die. Oh, that is nice, says the hostess. Do sing one, Mr. Harris. And then Harris gets up and makes for the piano with his beaming cheeriness of a generous-minded man who is just about to give somebody something. Now, silence, please, everybody, says the hostess, turning round. Mr. Harris is going to sing a comic song. Oh, how jolly, they murmur, and they hurry in from the conservatory and come up from the stairs and go and fetch each other from all over the house and crowd into the drawing room and sit round, all smirking in anticipation. Then Harris begins. Well, 
You don't look for much of a voice in a comic song. You don't expect correct phrasing or vocalization. You don't mind if a man does find out when in the middle of a note that he is too high and comes down with a jerk. You don't bother about time. You don't mind a man being two bars in front of the accompaniment and easing up in the middle of a line to argue it out with the pianist and then starting the verse afresh. But you do expect the words. You don't expect a man to never remember more than the first three lines of the first verse and to keep on repeating these until it is time to begin the chorus. You don't expect a man to break off in the middle of a line and chuckle and say, it's very funny, but he's blessed if he can think of the rest of it and then try to make it up for himself and afterwards suddenly recollect it when he has got to an entirely different part of the song and break off without a word of warning to go back and let you have it then and there. You don't... Well, I will just give you an idea of Harris's comic singing, then you can judge for yourself. Harris, standing up in front of piano and addressing the expectant mob. I'm afraid it's a very old thing, you know. I expect you all to know it, you know. But it's the only thing I know. It's the judge's song out of Pinafore. Um, oh, no, I don't mean Pinafore. I mean, um, you know what I mean. The other thing, you know, uh, you just all join in the chorus, you know. Murmurs of delight and anxiety to join in the chorus. Brilliant performance of the prelude to the judge's song in trial by jury by nervous pianist. Moment arrives for Harris to join in. Harris takes no notice of it. The nervous pianist commences prelude over again, and Harris, commencing singing at the same time, dashes off the first two lines of the First Lord's song out of Pinafore. Nervous pianist tries to push on with prelude, gives it up, and tries to follow Harris with accompaniment to Judge's song out of Trial by Jury, finds that doesn't answer, and tries to recollect what he is doing and where he is, feels his mind giving way, and stops short. Harris with kindly encouragement. It's all right. You're doing it very well indeed. Go on. Nervous pianist. I'm afraid there's a mistake somewhere. What are you singing? Harris, promptly. Why the judge's song out of trial by jury? Don't you know it? Some friend of Harris from the back of the room. No, you're not, you chucklehead. You're singing the Admiral's song from Pinafore. Long argument between Harris and Harris's friend as to what Harris is really singing friend finally suggests that it doesn't matter what Harris is singing so long as Harris gets on and sings it, and Harris, with an evident sense of injustice rankling inside him, requests Pianist to begin again. Pianist thereupon starts prelude to the Admiral's song, and Harris, seizing what he considers to be a favourable opening in the music, begins. When I was young and called to the bar, general roars of laughter taken by Harris as a compliment. Pianist thinking of his wife and family, gives up the unequal contest and retires, his place being taken by a stronger nerved man. The new pianist, cheerily. Now then, old mate, you start off and I'll follow. We won't bother about any prelude. Harris, upon whom the explanation of matters has slowly dawned, laughing. By Jove, I beg your pardon, of course. I've been mixing up the two songs. It was Jenkins who confused me, you know. Now then singing, his voice appearing to come from the cellar and suggesting the first low warnings of an approaching earthquake. When I was young I served a term as office boy to an attorney's firm. Aside to pianist. It's too low, old man. We'll have that over again, if you don't mind. Sings the first two lines over again in a high falsetto this time. Great surprise on the part of the audience. Nervous old lady near the fire begins to cry and has to be led out. Harris, continuing. I swept the windows and I swept the door and I... No, no, I cleaned the windows of the big front door and I polished up the floor. No, dash it, I, I beg your pardon. Funny thing, I can't think of that line. And I, and I... Oh, well, we'll get on to the chorus and, and chance it. And I diddle, 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 till now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. Now then, chorus, it's the last few lines repeated, you know. General chorus. And he diddle 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 dee till now he is the ruler of the Queen's Navy. And Harris never sees what an ass he is making of himself and how he is annoying a lot of people who never did him any harm. He honestly imagines that he has given them a treat and says he will sing another comic song after supper. Speaking of comic songs and parties reminds me of a rather curious incident at which I once assisted, which, as it throws much light upon the inner mental working of human nature in general, ought, I think, to be recorded in these pages. 
We were a fashionable and highly cultured party. We had on our best clothes, and we talked pretty and were very happy. All except two young fellows, students just returned from Germany, commonplace young men who seemed restless and uncomfortable, as if they found the proceedings slow. The truth was, we were too clever for them. Our brilliant but polished conversation and our high-class tastes were beyond them. They were out of place among us. They never ought to have been there at all. Everybody agreed upon that later on. We played Mosseau from the old German masters. We discussed philosophy and ethics. We flirted with graceful dignity. We were even humorous in a high-class way. Somebody recited a French poem after supper, and we said it was beautiful. And then a lady sang a sentimental ballad in Spanish, and it made one or two of us weep. It was so pathetic. And then those two young men got up and asked us if we had ever heard Herr Schlossenboschen, who had just arrived and was then down in the supper room, sing his great German comic song. None of us had heard it that we could remember. The young man said it was the funniest song that had ever been written, and that, if we liked, they would get Herr Schlossenboschen, whom they knew very well, to sing it. They said it was so funny that, when Herr Schlossenboschen had sung it once before, the German emperor, he, the German emperor, had to be carried off to bed. They said nobody could sing it like Herr Schlossenboschen. He was so intensely serious that all, though it made, that all through it that you might fancy he was reciting a tragedy, and that, of course, made it all the funnier. They said he never once suggested by his tone or manner that he was singing anything funny. That would spoil it. It was his air of seriousness, almost pathos, that made it so irresistibly amusing. We said we yearned to hear it, that we wanted a good laugh, and they all went downstairs and fetched Herslos and Boschen. He appeared to be quite pleased to sing it, for he came up at once and sat down to the piano without another word. "'Oh, it will amuse you. You will laugh,' whispered the two young men as they passed through the room and took up an unobtrusive position behind the professor's back. Herr Schlossenboschen accompanied himself. The prelude did not suggest a comic song, exactly. It was a weird, soulful air. It quite made one's flesh creep, but we murmured to one another that it was the German method, and prepared to enjoy it. I don't understand German myself. I learned it at school, but forgot every word of it two years after I had left, and have felt much better ever since. Since I still did not want the people there to guess my ignorance, so still I did not want the people there to guess my ignorance, so I hit upon what I thought to be a rather good idea. I kept my eye on the two young students and followed them. When they tittered, I tittered. When they roared, I roared. And I also threw in a little chuckle all by myself now and then, as if I had seen a bit, a bit of humour that had escaped the others. I considered this particularly artful on my part. I noticed the song, as the song progressed, that a good many other people seemed to have their eye fixed on the two young men as well, as on the two young men, as well as myself. These other people also tittered when the young men tittered, and roared when the young men roared, and as the two young men tittered and roared and exploded with laughter pretty continuously all through the song, it went exceedingly well. And yet the German professor did not seem happy. At first, when we began to laugh, the expression on his face was one of intense surprise, as if laughter were the very last thing he had expected to be greeted with. We thought this very funny. We said his earnest manner was half the humour. The slightest hint on his part that we knew that he knew how funny he was would have completely ruined it all. As we continued to laugh, his surprise gave way to an air of annoyance and indignation, and he scowled fiercely round the room, sorry, round upon us all, except upon the two young men, who, being behind him, he could not see. That sent us into convulsions. We told each other that it would be the death of us, this thing. The words alone we said were enough to send us into fits, but added to his mock seriousness, oh, it was too much. In the last verse he surpassed himself. He glowered round upon us with a look of such concentrated ferocity that, but for our being forewarned as to the German method of comic singing, we should have been nervous. And he threw such a wailing note of agony into the weird music that, if we had not known it was a funny song, we might have wept. He finished amid a perfect shriek of laughter. 
We said it was the funniest thing we had ever heard in all our lives. We said how strange it was that, in the face of things like these, there should be a popular notion that the Germans hadn't any sense of humour. And we asked the professor why he didn't translate the song into English so that the common people could understand it and hear what a real comic song was like. Then Herr Slossenboschen got up and went on awful. He swore at us in German, which I should judge to be a singularly effective language for that purpose, and he danced and shook his fists and called us all the English he knew. He said he had never been so insulted in all his life. It appeared that the song was not a comic song at all. It was about a young girl who lived in the Hartz Mountains, and who had given up her life to save her lover's soul, and he died and met her spirit in the air. And then, in the last verse, he jilted her spirit and went off with another spirit. I'm not quite sure of the details, but it was something very sad, I know. Herr Boschen said he had sung it once before the German Emperor, and he, the German Emperor, had sobbed like a little child. He, Herr Boschen, said it was generally acknowledged to be one of the most tragic and pathetic songs in the German language. It was a trying situation for us. Very trying. There seemed to be no answer. We looked round for the two young men who had done this thing, but they had left the house in an unostentatious manner immediately after the end of the song. That was the end of that party. I never saw a party break up so quietly and with so little fuss. We never said good night even to one another. We came downstairs one at a time, walking softly and keeping the shady side. We asked the servant for our hats and coats in whispers and opened the door for ourselves and slipped out and got round the corner quickly, avoiding each other as much as possible. I have never taken much interest in German songs since then. We reached Sunbury Lock at half past three. The river is sweetly pretty just there before sorry, the river is sweetly pretty just there before you come to the gates, and the backwater is charming, but don't attempt to row up it. I tried to do so once. I was sculling, and asked the fellows who were steering if they thought it could be done, and they said, Oh, yes, they thought so, if I pulled hard. We were just under the little footbridge that crosses it between two weirs, when they pulled this, so when they said this, and I bent down over the sculls and set myself up and pulled. I pulled splendidly. I got well into a steady rhythmical swing. I put my arms and my legs and my back into it. I set myself a good, quick, dashing stroke and worked in really grand style. My two friends said it was a pleasure to watch me. At the end of five minutes, I thought we ought to be pretty near the weir, and I looked up. We were under the bridge, in exactly the same spot that we were when I began, and there were those two idiots injuring themselves by violent laughing. I had been grinding away like mad to keep that boat stuck still under the bridge. I let other people pull up backwaters against strong streams now. We sculled up to Walton, a rather large place for a riverside town. As with all riverside places, only the tiniest corner of it comes down to the water, so that from the boat you might fancy it was a village of some half-dozen houses, all told. Windsor and Abingdon are the only towns between London and Oxford that you can really see anything of from the stream. All the others hide round corners and merely peep at the river down one street. My thanks to them for being so considerate and leaving the river banks to woods and fields and waterworks. Even Reading, though it does its best to spoil and sully and make hideous as much of the river as it can, is good-natured enough to keep its ugly face a good deal out of sight. Caesar, of course, had a little place at Walton, a camp or entrenchment or something of that sort. Caesar was a regular upriver man. Also Queen Elizabeth, she was there too. You can never get away from that woman. Go where you will. Cromwell and Bradshaw, not the guide man, but the King Charles's head man, likewise sojourned there. They must have been quite a pleasant little party altogether. There was an iron scold's bridle in Walton Church. They used these things in ancient days for curbing women's tongues. They have given up the attempt now. I suppose iron was getting scarce and nothing else would be strong enough. There were also tombs of note in the church, and I was afraid I should never get Harris past them, but he didn't seem to think of them, and we went on. Above the bridge, the river winds tremendously. This makes it look picturesque, but it irritates you from a towing or sculling point of view, and causes arguments between the man who is pulling and the man who is steering. You pass Oatlands Park on the right bank here. It is a famous old place. Henry VIII stole it from someone or the other, I forget whom now, and lived in it. There is a grotto in the park which you can see for a fee, and which is supposed to be very wonderful. But I cannot see much in it myself. 
The late Duchess of York, who lived at Oatlands, was very fond of dogs and kept an immense number. She had a special graveyard made in which to bury them when they died, and here they lie, about fifty of them, with a tombstone over each and an epitaph inscribed thereon. Well, I dare say they deserve it quite as much as the average Christian does. At Corway Stakes, the first bend above Walton Bridge, was, found, was fought a battle between Caesar and Cassivellaunus. Cassivellaunus had prepared the river for Caesar by planting it full of stakes, and had no doubt put up a notice board. But Caesar crossed in spite of this. You couldn't choke Caesar off that river. He is a sort of man we want round the backwaters now. Halliford and Shepperton are both pretty little spots where they touch the river, but there is nothing remarkable about either of them. There is a tomb in Shepperton churchyard, however, with a poem on it, and I was nervous lest Harris should want to get out and fool round it. I saw him fix a longing eye on the landing stage as we drew near to it, so I managed, by an adroit movement, to jerk his cap into the water, and in the excitement of recovering that and his indignation at my clumsiness, he forgot all about his beloved graves. At Weybridge, the Way, a pretty little stream navigable by, for small boats up to Guildford, and one which I have always been making up my mind to explore and never have, the Bourne and the Basingstoke Canal all enter the Thames together. The lock is just opposite the town, and the first thing that we saw when we came in view of it was George's blazer on one of the lock gates, closer inspection showing that George was inside it. Montmorency set up a furious barking. I shrieked, Harris roared. George waved his hat and yelled back. The lock keeper rushed out with a drag, under the impression that somebody had fallen into the lock, and appeared annoyed at finding that no one had. George had rather a curious oilskin-covered parcel in his hand. It was round and flat at one end, with a long straight handle sticking out of it. "'What's that?' said Harris. A frying pan?' "'No,' said George, with a strange, wild look glittering in his eyes. "'They are all the rage this season. Everybody has got them up the river. It's a banjo.' "'I never knew you played the banjo,' cried Harris and I in one breath. "'Not exactly,' replied George. "'But it's very easy, they tell me, and I've got the instruction book.' Chapter 9 George is introduced to work. Heathenish instincts of tow lines, ungrateful conduct of a double sculling skiff, to towers and towed, a use discovered for lovers, strange disappearance of an elderly lady, much haste, less speed, being towed by girls, exciting sensation, the missing lock or the haunted river, music. Saved. We made George work, now we had got him. He did not want to work, of course, that goes without saying. He had had a hard time in the city, so he explained. Harris, who is callous in his nature, and not prone to pity, said, Ah, and now you are going to have a hard time on the river for a change. Change is good for everyone. Out you get. He could not, in conscience, not even George's conscience, object, though he did suggest that perhaps it would be better for him to stop in the boat and get tea ready while Harris and I towed, because getting tea was such a worrying work, and Harris and I looked tired. The only reply we made to this, however, was to pass him the tow line, and he took it and stepped out. There is something very strange and unaccountable about a tow line. You roll it up with as much patience and care as you would take to fold up a new pair of trousers, and five minutes afterwards, when you pick it up, it is one ghastly, soul-revolting tangle. I do not wish to be insulting, but I firmly believe that if you took an average tow line and stretched it out across the middle of a field, and then turned your back on it for thirty seconds, that when you looked round again you would find that it had got itself all together in a heap in the middle of the field, and had twisted itself up and tied knots into knot, and tried tied itself into knots, and lost its two ends, and become all loops and it would take a good half hour sitting down there in the grass and swearing all the while to disentangle it again. That is my opinion of tow lines in general. Of course, there may be honourable exceptions. I do not say that there are not. There may be tow lines that are a credit to their profession, conscientious, respectable tow lines, tow lines that do not imagine they are crochet work and try to knit themselves up into anti macassars the instant they are left to themselves. I say there may be such tow lines, I sincerely hope there are, but I have not met with them. This tow line I had taken in myself just before we had got to the lock. 
I would not let Harris touch it, because he is careless. I had looped it round slowly and cautiously, and tied it up in the middle, and folded it in two, and laid it down gently at the bottom of the bottom of the boat. Harris had lifted it up scientifically, and had put it into George's hand. George had taken it firmly, and held it away from him, and had begun to unravel it as if he were waking the, sorry, taking the swaddling clothes off a newborn infant. And before he had unwound a dozen yards, the thing was more like a badly made doormat than anything else. It is always the same, and the same sort of thing always goes on in connection with it. The man on the bank who is trying to disentangle it thinks all the fault lies with the man who rolled it up, and the man up the river thinks a th and when a man up the river thinks a thing, he says it. What have you been trying to do with it? Make a fishing net of it? You've made such a mess, you have. Why, you couldn't wind it up properly, you silly dummy, he grunts from time to time as he struggles wildly with it and lays it out flat on the towpath and runs round and round it, trying to find the end. On the other end, the man who wound it up thinks the whole cause of the muddle rests with the man who is trying to unwind it. It's all right when you took it, he exclaims indignantly. Why don't you think what you're doing? You go about things in such a slapdash style, you get a scaffolding pole entangled, you would and they feel so angry with one another that they, they would like to hang each other with the thing. Ten minutes go by, and the first man gives a yell and goes mad and dances on the rope and tries to pull it straight by seizing hold of the first piece that comes to his hand and hauling it. Of course, this only gets it into a tighter tangle than ever. Then the second man climbs out of the boat and comes to help him, and they get in each other's way and hinder one another. They both get hold of the same bit of line and pull at it in the opposite sorry, pull at it in opposite directions and wonder where it is caught. In the end they do get it clear, and then turn round and find that the boat has drifted off and is making straight for the weir. This re really happened once to my own knowledge. It was up by Boveney one rather windy morning. We were pulling downstream, and as we came round the bend we noticed a couple of men on the bank. They were looking at each other with as bewildered and helplessly miserable expressions as I have ever witnessed on my human countenance before or since, and they held a long tow line between them. It was clear that something had happened, so he eased up and asked them what was the matter. "'Why, our boat's gone off,' they replied in an indignant tone. "'We'd just gone out to disentangle the tow line, and when we looked round it was gone.' and they seemed hurt at what they evidently regarded as a mean and ungrateful axe on the part of the boat. We found the truant for them half a mile further down, held by some rushes, and we brought it back to them. I bet they did not give that boat another chance for a week. I shall never forget the picture of those two men walking up and down the bank with a tow line looking for their boat. One sees a good many funny incidents up the river in connection with towing, one of the most common is the sight of a couple of towers walking briskly along, deep in an animated discussion, while the man in the boat, a hundred yards behind them, is vainly shrieking to them to stop, and making frantic signs of distress with a skull. Something has gone wrong. The rudder has come off, or the boat hook has slipped overboard, or his hat has dropped into the water and is floating rapidly downstream. He calls to them to stop, quite gently and politely at first. Hi, stop a minute, will you? He shouts cheerily. I've dropped my hat overboard. Then, Hi, Tom, Dick, can't you hear? Not quite so affably this time. Then, Hi, confound you, you dunderheaded idiot. I, stop, oh, do you... After that, he springs up and dances about and roars himself red in the face and curses everything he knows. And the small boys on the bank stop and jeer at him and pitch stones at him as he is pulled along past them at the rate of four miles an hour and can't get out. Much of this sort of trouble would be saved if those who are towing would keep remembering that they are towing, and give a pretty frequent look round to see how their man is getting on. It is best to let one person tow. When two are doing it they get chattering and forget, and the boat itself, offering as it does but little resistance, is of no real service in reminding them of the facts. As an example of how utterly oblivious a pair of towers can be to their work, George told us later on in the evening, when we were discussing the subject after supper, of a very curious instance. 
He and three other men, so he said, were sculling a very heavily laden boat up from Maidenhead one evening, and a little above Cookham Lock they noticed a fellow and a girl walking along the towpath, both deep in an apparently interesting and absorbing conversation. They were carrying a boat hook between them, and attached to the boat hook was a tow line, which trailed behind them in its end in the water. No boat was near, no boat was in sight. There must have been a boat attached to that tow line at some time or other, that was certain. But what had become of it, what ghastly fate had overtaken it, and those who had been left in it, was buried in mystery. Whatever the accident may have been, however, it had in no way disturbed the young lady and gentleman who were towing. They had the boat hook, and they had the line, and that seems to be all they thought necessary to their work. George was about to call out and wake them up, but at that moment a bright idea flashed across him, and he didn't. He got the hitcher instead, and reached over and drew in the end of the tow line, and they made a loop of it and put it over their mast, and then they tidied up their skulls and went and sat down in the stern and lit their pipes. And that young man and young woman towed those four hulking chaps in a heavy boat up to Marlow. George said he never saw so much thoughtful sadness concentrated into one glance before, as when, at the lock, that young couple grasped the idea that, for the last two miles, they had been towing the wrong boat. George fancied that, if it had not been for the restraining influence of the sweet woman at his side, the young man might have given way to violent language. The maiden was the first to recover her surprise, and, when she did, she clasped her hands and said wildly, "'Oh, Henry, where is Auntie?' "'Did they ever recover the old lady?' asked Harris. George replied, he did not know. Another example of the dangerous want of sympathy between Tower and Toad was witnessed by George and myself once up near Walton. It was where the towpath shelves gently down into the water, and we were camping on the opposite bank, noticing things in general. By and by a small boat came in sight, towed through the water at a tremendous pace by a powerful barge horse on which sat a very small boy. Scattered about the boat, in dreamy and reposeful attitudes, lay five fellows, the man who was steering having a particularly restful appearance. "'I should like to see him pull the wrong line,' murmured George as they passed, and at that precise moment the man did. And the boat rushed up the bank with a noise like the ripping up of forty thousand linen sheets. Two men, a hamper, and three oars immediately left the boat on the larboard side and reclined on the bank, and one and a half moments afterwards two other men disembarked from the starboard and sat down among the boat hooks and sails and carpet bags and bottles. The last man went on twenty yards further and then got out on his head. This seemed to sort of lighten the boat, and it went on much easier, the boy shouting at the top of his voice and urging his steed to, into a gallop. The fellows sat up and stared at one another. It was some seconds before they realised what had happened to them, but when they did, they began to shout lustily for the boy to stop. He, however, was too much occupied with the horse to hear them, and we watched them flying after him until the distance hid them from view. I cannot say I was sorry at their mishap. Indeed, I only wish, only wish that all the young fools who have their boats towed in this fashion, and plenty do, could meet with similar misfortunes. Besides the risk they run themselves, they become a danger and an annoyance to every other boat they pass. Going at the pace they do, it is impossible for them to get out of anybody else's way, or for anybody else to get out of theirs. Their line gets hitched across your mast and overturns you, or it catches somebody in the boat and either throws them into the water or cuts their face open. The best plan is to stand your ground and be prepared to keep them off with the butt end of a mast. Of all experiences in connection with towing, the most exciting is being towed by girls. It is a sensation that nobody ought to miss. It takes three girls to tow always, two to hold the rope, and the other one runs around round and giggles. They generally begin by getting themselves tied up. They get the line round their legs and have to sit down on the path and undo each other, and then they twist it round their necks and are nearly strangled. They fix it straight, however, at last, and start off at a run, pulling the boat along at quite a dangerous pace. At the end of a hundred yards, they are naturally breathless and suddenly stop and all sit down on the grass and laugh, and your boat drifts out to midstream and turns round before you know what has happened or can get a hold of the skull. Then they stand up and look surprised. Oh, look, they say, he's gone right out into the middle. 
They pull on pretty steadily for a bit after this, and then it all at once occurs to the, so to one of them that she will pull up sorry that she will pin up her frock, and they ease up for the purpose, and the boat runs aground. You jump up and push it off, and you shout to them not to stop. Yes, what's the matter? They shout back. Don't stop. You roar. Don't what? Don't stop. Go on. Go on. Go back, Emily, and see what it is they want, says one, and Emily comes back and asks what it is. What do you want? She says. Anything happened? No, you reply. It's all right. Only go on, you know. Don't stop. Why not? Why, we can't steer if you keep stopping. You must keep some way on the boat. Keep some what? Some way. You must keep the boat moving. Oh, all right. I'll tell him. Are we doing it all right? Oh, yes, very nicely indeed. Only don't stop. It doesn't seem difficult at all. I thought it was so hard. Oh, no, it's simple enough. You, you want to keep on steady at it, that's all. I see. Give me out my red shawl. It's under the cushion. You find the shawl and hand it out, and by this time another has come back and thinks she will have hers too, and they take Mary's on chance, and Mary does not want it, so they bring it back and have a pocket comb instead. It is about twenty minutes before they get off again, and at the next corner they see a cow, and you have to leave the boat to chivy the cow out of their way. There is never a dull moment in the boat while girls are towing it. George got the line right after a while and towed us steadily on to Penton Hook. There we discussed the important question of camping. We had decided to sleep on board that night, and we had either to lay up just there, just about there, or go on past Staines. It seemed early to think about shutting up then, however, with the sun still in the heavens, and we settled to push past, sorry, to push straight on for Runnymede three and a half miles further, the quiet wooded part of the river, and where there is good shelter. We all wished, however, afterward that we had stopped at Penton Hook. Three or four miles upstream is a trifle early in the morning, but it is a weary pull at the end of a long day. You take no interest in the scenery during these last few miles. You do not chat and laugh. Every half mile you cover seems like two. You can hardly believe you are only where you are, and you are convinced that the map must be wrong. And when you have trudged along for what seems to you at least ten miles and still the lock is not in sight, you begin to seriously fear that somebody must have sneaked it and run off with it. I remember being terribly upset once up the river, in a figurative sense, I mean. I was out with a young lady, a cousin on my mother's side, and we were pulling down the goring. It was rather late, and we were anxious to get in. At least she was anxious to get in. It was half past six when we reached Benson's Lock, and dusk was drawing on, and she began to get excited then. She said she must be in to supper. I said it was a thing I felt I wanted to be in at too, and I drew out a map I had with me to see exactly how far it was. I saw it was just a mile and a half to the next lock, Wallingford, and five on from there to Cleve. Oh, it's all right, I said. We'll be through the next lock before seven, and then there is only one more and I settled down and pulled steadily away. We passed the bridge, as, and soon after that I asked if she saw the lock. She said no, she did not see any lock. And I said, oh, and pulled on. Another five minutes went by, and then I asked her to look again. No, she said, I can't see any signs of a lock. You are, you are sure you know a lock when you do see one? I asked hesitatingly, not wishing to offend her. The question did not offend her, however, and she suggested that I had better look for myself, so I laid down the skulls and took a view. The river stretched out straight before us in the twilight for about a mile. Not a ghost of a lock was to be seen. "'You don't think we have lost our way, do you?' asked my companion. I did not see how that was possible, though, as I suggested, we might have somehow got into the weir stream and been making for the falls. This idea did not comfort her in the least, and she began to cry. She said we should both be drowned, and that it was a judgment on her for coming out with me. It seemed an excessive punishment, I thought, but my cousin thought not, and hoped it would all soon be over. I tried to reassure her, and make light of the whole affair. I said that the fact evidently was that I was not rowing as fast as I fancied I was, but that we should soon reach the lock now, and I pulled on for another mile. Then I began to get nervous myself. I looked again at the map. There was Wallingford Lock, clearly marked a mile and a half below Benson's. It was a good, reliable map, and, besides, I recollected the lock myself. 
I had been through it twice. Where were we? What had happened to us? I began to think it must all be a dream, and that I was really asleep in bed, and should wake up in a minute and be told it was past ten. I asked my cousin if she thought it could be a dream, and she replied that she was just about to ask me the same question, and then we both wondered if we were both asleep, and if so, who was the real one that was dreaming, and who was the one that was only a dream? It got quite interesting. I still went on pulling, however, and still no lock came in sight, and the river grew more and more gloomy and mysterious under the gathering shadows of night, and things seemed to be getting weird and uncanny. I thought of hobgoblins and banshees and will-o'-the-wisps, and those wicked girls who sit up all night on rocks and lure people into whirlpools and things. And I wished I had been a better man, and knew more hymns, and in the middle of these reflections I heard the blessed strains of He's got em on, played badly on a concertina, and knew that we were saved. I do not admire the tones of a concertina as a rule, but oh, how beautiful the music seemed to us both then! Far! far more beautiful than the voice of Orpheus or the lute of Apollo or anything of that sort could have sounded. Heavenly melody in our state that, sorry, in our state of mind would only have still further harrowed us. A soul-moving harmony correctly performed we should have taken as a spirit warning and have given up all hope. But about the strains of He's Got Em On jerk spasmodically and with involuntary variations out of a wheezy accordion there was something singularly human and reassuring. The sweet sounds drew nearer, and soon the boat from which they were works came alongside us. It contained a party of provincial Aries and Ariots, out for a moonlight sail. There was not any moon, but that was not their fault. I never saw more attractive, lovable people in all my life. I hailed them, and asked if they could tell me the way to Wallingford Lock, and I explained that I had been looking for it the last two hours. Wallingford Lock? They answered, Lord love you, sir, that's been done away with for over a year. There ain't no Wallingford Lock now, sir. You're close to Cleve now. Blow me tight if there ain't a gentleman been looking for Wallingford Lock, Bill. I had never thought of that. I wanted to fall upon all their necks and bless them, but the stream was running too strong just there to allow this, so I had to content myself with the mere cold-sounding words of gratitude. We thanked them over and over again, and we said it was a lovely night, and we wished them a pleasant trip, and I think I invited them all to come and spend a week with me, and my cousin said her mother would be so pleased to see them, and we sang the soldiers' chorus out of Faust, and got home in time for supper after all. And that exciting event brings us to the end of the chapter, and where I shall finish for tonight. So thank you for listening. Well then, some nautical progress has been made. They have acquired a banjo and are still on day one, really, of their boat excursion. Huzzah. Huzzah, indeed. Um, and hello, Lucy, welcome. I did see you sneak in. I, you, you missed... So, I was chatting to Lucy earlier, and I was like, I know you're out this evening. Are you going to be back for the second half? Because the first part of the second half I think you will appreciate... And you came back at, like, the second part of the first part of the second half. Um, but, yeah, I I think it's very fun. I'm still enjoying it. It's, it's very good. But how is everyone? How are we? Are we all good? Oh, you read it back and it means... Oh, right, the, the whole um, Gilbert Sullivan, HMS Pinafore bit. Good. Um, but, yeah, hello. How are we all? Have you all had a good time this evening? If you all, woo, you know, hit a, hit a rock. Um, I have a quick look. I don't see anyone that I immediately feel an impulse to raid, but I'll, I'll have a quick look on the reading aloud uh, and see if see if there's what? No. Why do you have a reading aloud on if you're playing Spider Man? That is, that is not how that works, friend. Um, yeah, looks like mostly... I said, oh, wait. Ooh, so I, I've, I see someone reading some Virginia Woolf. Do we, do we want to go make a new friend? There is a... 
I'll have a quick check on your rules to see what kind of respect to everybody, no exceptions, okay. Yeah. Alright. Yeah, there was a there was a VTuber who was reading To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. If if that sounds like something that people would like to go and see. New friend reading sad book? Yeah. You right, Pirelli? You enjoy it? Good. I am glad. Um yeah, okay. Let's let's go on a raid. Let's go make a new friend. Um Yeah. Thank you thank you all for being here, everybody. This has been fun. Um I deserve an award for the sound effects and voice. I'm gonna go back and read chat for some of the bits. Um because I'm I'm curious what was said. Um wait, sound effects? Do I do sound effects? I don't know. I'm confused now. Um But yeah, I um oh thank yeah again like thank thank you thank you people for being here um it it genuinely makes a difference knowing that there are people actually like watching and listening and enjoying this like obviously don't feel you have to show up if you're not enjoying it that's totally fine um but yeah if if we're if we're putting out something that people enjoy and and people are here to enjoy it that's all we can ask um so yeah thank you oh i do the distant voice oh i get no that's fine that's yeah i I've only I've only just thought oh that's the thing I should start doing just lean back from the mic when I'm doing that, um, so yeah, um, no don't don't put again do not put your English down, your English is your English is so much better than my any other non English language so like yes my mic does let me do that it's very helpful in that way, um, right anyway, what is they right what is his name your name is that we're gonna go and spook a new friend. Because I always feel like confused when someone raised I don't know, and we're going to do that to someone else. But they, I hope they're a lovely person. Um, I'm sure they will be. And again, I was worried that like they'll do the thing that I do when someone I don't know raised me, and I go and like check the end of the channel. Like, why did you choose me? What did you have to say about me? Um, so, Wonder Asthma, I love the bare VTube rig that you have, and frankly, the the aesthetic you've got going on for this is kind of tip top, and I would like something very similar here. Um, yeah, let's 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 go let's go make a new friend. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's it's been a fun evening. We will be back in theory on when. Actually, yeah, we. I think we were going to try and do a chiletra tea on Monday, possibly. Keep an eye on the socials for that. Maybe I'm not entirely certain, but probably because that might be our last chance to do it this month. Um, so keep an eye for that. Uh, more podcast discussing things where I've said I've got stuff I want to say about this book and uh, then more talking over the games with continuing adventures of Scarlet Hollow and then in theory I think unless she tells me I'm wrong Lucy back on Wednesday there will not be a stream next Saturday um, I don't know if I will be able to do something before then but definitely no stream next Saturday because we are both busy um but yeah keep keep an eye on on those socials and you know what keep yourselves cool and happy and well and whatever else you need um yeah and good good sentiment sam and um yeah we will we will see you on the next one thank you all for being here and goodbye and good night <laughs>